It's volume 9, page 11. Ellen White said, the days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Folks, have you ever thought why people seem to be getting crazy? I mean, you know, what you read, what you see, what you hear, you go, people are getting nuts. They're get, they really are. And, and it's getting worse. And we see it in the convulsions that we see in nature. Things are out of whack. Why? The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. And it is. And we can see it with our eyes. Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea. The unsettled state of society. Wow, the unsettled state of society. Is she talking about the stock market? I mean, how much more unsettled could it be? It's, it's like a roller coaster. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up. It's crazy. It's so unsettled, folks. The alarms of war are portentous. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They're strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world. And the final movements will be rapid ones. You know, folk, there used to be a time when I was writing my newsletters every month that when I'd come up to the time to write, I would sit and I'd say, now, I like to focus on the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the light of the great controversy and current events. What has happened over the last month that I could talk about? And sometimes I didn't have anything. But you know what, folk, the way it is today? I, I went out to California the 7th, 8th, and 9th of August. I was in Loma Linda and then went down to San Diego to speak. And what I said that weekend, I said, you know, the Pope's coming in seven weeks to America, and we talked about that. Folk, the very next week, Francis comes out with a, a little homily called a catechesis in which he called Sunday rest sacred. And I'm going... It doesn't stop. It's going so fast. It's like what I preach about now, by next week, that's old news. It's going so quickly. So quickly. And that's exactly what Ellen White said. The final movements would be rapid ones. Now, unfortunately, many Seventh-day Adventists in various localities when they talk about final movements, they want to attach time to it. They want to take Daniel 12, and they want to say, well, you know, all that time, that's in the future. No, it's not. Don't attach time prophecy, folk, to the future. Ellen White, as Revelation chapter 10 said, with the prophecy of 1844, time would be no longer. There is no more time prophecy. So if you hear somebody saying that, say, uh-uh, I'm not going there with you. You stop them in their tracks, folk. We know this, that the final movements will go very quickly. But don't attach a time to it. Washington, Oregon this year, the stock market just collapsing, going up and down. Final movements will be rapid ones. They'll go very quickly. Now, Francis is coming this next week. What's he going to talk about? What are the big things on his agenda? Well, Oscar Rodriguez Maradiaga, he is a cardinal. He works at Georgetown University. He is very close to Francis, and he said 
these would be two of the major things that Francis would talk about. Number one, welcoming immigrants. Now, Francis is not talking about those who have gone to the embassies in their country and gone through the paperwork and signed the appropriate documents and then come to America legally. That's not what he's talking about. Folk, Francis is talking about opening the borders of the southern part of the United States and letting people from Central and South America just walk into this country. Why? Because 95 to 98 percent of them are Roman Catholic. That's why. Francis would have liked to enter the U.S. by crossing the border with Mexico to make a point about welcoming immigrants, not building walls to keep them out. Folk, there is not a nation on the face of the earth that is confused about illegal immigrants. There isn't a nation on the earth except the United States. Why? Why? Are we so confused? If somebody tries to go into Germany illegally, you know what they'll do? They'll shoot them on the spot. They'll arrest them. They'll send them back home. They would never allow them into their country illegally. You don't do that, folk, on any nation in this world. But somehow, it's becoming popular in America. You know what that tells me? It tells me that Rome controls the media of the United States, they control the government officials of the United States, and they are pushing them to open up our borders, to bring in all these Roman Catholics into our country. That's what Francis is going to tell Congress, folk. That's one of the things. Another thing he's going to talk about is protecting the environment. Now, Maradiaga came out with this back in March. Well, in June, Francis came out with an encyclical on the environment ahead of his United States visit. Observes, ob observers expect the encyclical to accept the reality of climate change, mankind's role, in, and the call for action to address the dangers. Well, folk, Francis came out with this encyclical. It came out in June. It was called Praised Be. Some of the things that Francis talked about in saving the environment have a whole lot to do with the United Nations resolve to save the environment as well. Some of the things that the United Nations and Francis want to do to save the environment, do you want to hear what those things are? It's called Agenda 21, or the Global Biodiversity Assessment Report. This is what Francis and the UN are telling us about how to save the environment. They say, the American way of life of private property ownership, owning your own home must go. That's destroying the environment. So what are they saying, folks? They're saying they want to destroy the American way of life. That's what Francis and the UN want to do. Redistribution of wealth. Another thing they want to do is eliminate private car ownership. You can't drive your car to church anymore. Why? Because that's destroying the environment. So what is the point? The point, folk, is, is that Francis and the UN have zeroed in on America and they want American Protestantism completely annihilated. That's their goals. Another thing they're saying is they want to stop individual travel choices. What does that mean? 
Well, if somebody wants to get on a plane in Florida and fly to Oregon to spend time with friends and to speak in the Coos Bay Church on Sabbath morning, the UN and the Pope are saying, that's destroying our environment. Now, when you hear those words, are you saying that is the biggest bunch of gobbledygook I've ever heard? That's what they want to do, folks. That's what they want to do. And you know who totally supports that? The Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Totally supports that. You say, that's the most ridiculous thing. I mean, sure, the denomination's doing some dumb things, but they'd never go that far. Well, if you go to the April 6th, April 6th Review and Herald, of this year, April 6th, the keynote article, it talks about the meeting between Ted Wilson and Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN. Now this is what, at the end of the article, the Adventist World Church Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department Chairman a man by the name of Ganoun Diop, he said this, the impressive portfolio that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has developed for the service to the whole human family remarkably resonates with the developmental goals of the United Nations. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church Ted Wilson, they absolutely support the destruction of American life and Protestantism in the United States. Welcome, welcome to the end of time. You know, folk, when I was up in that conference in Pennsylvania and I was talking about this, I looked out and I said, you know what? 23 years ago, I was fired from the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. And I said, eight months ago, I was in a restaurant in Loma Linda, a spaghetti factory, having lunch with my son and my wife. And the man who fired me 23 years ago was sitting right next to me. Oh, no. Folk, I hadn't seen him in 23 years. I shook his hand. I said, Elder Hutchins, it's good to see you. He said, well, Bob, no, he said, Dave. He said, Dave, it's good to see you too. And I said, that's all right. He can call me anything he wants, just not late to dinner. <laughs> well, you know what, folk? I sat there, he said, Dave, how you doing? He said, I've seen some of your, your videos on YouTube. He said, how you doing? I said, Elder Hutchins, God has been so good to me. I said, he has allowed me to preach the three angels' messages throughout this world. And later on, back at our motel, my wife said, so what did you talk to Elder Hutchins about? So I told her and she said, you know what? You forgot to tell him one thing. I said, what's that, dear? She said, you forgot to thank him for firing you 23 years ago. I said, you're right. What a blessing. I didn't have to go through spiritual formation. Folk, could I as a Seventh-day Adventist embrace this? I stated this two weeks ago in Pennsylvania, this very document that I just shared with you. After lunch the next day, a man came up to me and said, could I speak with you for a minute? I said, of course, sir. He said, I am the local pastor of this church. I said, well, it's nice to meet you. He said, I have a real problem with something you said last night. I said, what could that possibly have been? 
He said, well, you made comments about the leaders of the general conference. And they were very critical. And I said, yes, they were, sir. And I continue to be critical of decisions such as that. He said, but do you know what it says on page 168 of the church manual? I said, no, sir, what does it say? And he said, the church manual says we are to say absolutely nothing against the leaders of the denomination. And I said, sir, and what does Matthew chapter 3 say about the words that John the Baptist used to describe the Adventist leaders of the first century. I said, what word did John use to describe the leaders of Seventh-day Adventism? He said, he said, well, he used the word snakes. I said, sir, that's exactly what he said. And I said, by the grace of God, I will use words similar to that to describe the apostasy amongst us as a people. Folk, he got very nervous. And he backed away and he said, he said, but sir, the conference president might call me this week and he might, he might demand of me, why did you allow that, that guy to, to be critical of the denominational leaders? And I said, sir, let me give you my phone number. And if the conference president calls you this week, give him my number and have him call me. And I'll, I'll explain to him very clearly what I said and why I said it. Folk, there is a fear. There is a fear in Seventh-day Adventism today because they've cast away the truth. And they're looking to leaders to save them. And leaders, folk, can't save anybody. Anybody. And if you speak out against them, you've just pulled the rug out from underneath their feet. And it scared him to death. Well, folk, the truth is still the truth. And we need to tell the truth. So what is in Francis's document besides those things? Well, let me read a little bit to you. It's divided up in, by numbers. I think they're like paragraphs. But in the paragraph that's numbered 237 in Francis's encyclical that came out in June, this is what he said. He said, Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation. What is his point? Francis' point, friends, was very, very clear. If you want to have harmonious relationships at home, you need to go to church on Sunday. If you need and want to have relationships that are harmonious with people you work with or at church, you need to go to church on Sunday. And the way to save the environment, the way to save the depleting minerals and the depletion of Earth's resources, we need to get back to Sunday worship. Have we followed cunningly devised fables, friends? We've been preaching this for 160 years. Is that a fable? No, that's the truth. And Francis is telling us exactly what great controversy said. Amen. Exactly what he said, friends. Exactly what Ellen White said in great controversy and other places. Francis again said, Sunday is a day which heals our relationships with God, ourselves, with others, and with the world. This is Maradiaga. He said that Francis would discuss the protection of the environment when he comes to America. In his encyclical, Praise Be, Francis has made it clear that the way to save our environment is through keeping Sunday. 
This will definitely be part of his message to Congress, the President, and the Catholics of Philadelphia. Folk, I praise God. I praise God because what this says is, if God says go, we're, we're going to see the second coming of Christ. We're going to see, folk, what the great controversy has been shouting to this planet for the last, what, 140 years since the vision in Lovett's Grove. That vision has been shouting to this world. There's a great controversy, and it's over the law of God. And we're going to see it, folks. If God says go, we're going to see it. Well, the Bible talked about the snake. There's a snake in our world today. It's got his venom, and it's shooting out from his tongue. It's shooting out to enslave, to snare, and to destroy the inhabitants of this world. Daniel 7, 24 and 25 talks about the little horn power, the snake in the world that would speak great words, blasphemous words, claiming to be God, claiming power to forgive sins. He would speak against the Most High, would wear out the saints of the Most High. He would persecute God's people. He would think to change times and those laws, the laws of Ten Commandments. And they would be given into his hand for a time, times, and the dividing of time. There's that 1260 year period of the dark ages in which the snake-like papal power would seek to wear out God's people and to change the law of God from Sabbath to Sunday. And of course, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 7. You guys, do any of you guys remember when we were in that, uh, that library at the Coos Bay Church? Renee, you remember that? Mm -hmm. Joanne, you remember? Ladies, you remember? Clark, okay. Maybe you don't remember this, but I'll never forget it. In the afternoon meeting, we spoke on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 on the man of sin, the man of lawlessness. Well, folk, for those of you that weren't there, it was in the public library right here in Coos Bay. Well, there were many Roman Catholics. The, the Catholic priest was there during the morning service. The afternoon meeting, we spoke on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we talked about the man of sin, the man of lawlessness. After the meeting was over, I put my Bible in my briefcase, and I turned to get up, and standing right in front of me were three women. And the one in the middle had a chain with a cross right there. And her face was as red as a, a red delicious apple. Or as one of the strawberries in Bud and Barb's garden. She was beet red. And she looked at me. The other two were just looking on as, as bystanders to support this one. She looked at me and she pointed her finger right in my face. She said, don't you ever talk about 2 Thessalonians again and apply it to the Pope. She said, don't you dare. I looked at her and I got a little bit closer to her finger and I said, ma'am, as long as I have blood flowing through these veins, I will declare that truth. Amen. Folk, those three women, they turned tail and they flew. They flew out of that library conference room. They were livid. You know, I still pray for those ladies. And I still pray for that Catholic priest because the Holy Spirit takes the truth of God that they heard in those meetings and continues to bring it back to them 
till they either say, no, I don't want to hear it ever again. But folk, if we're praying for them, the Holy Spirit can continue to say, that's the truth. Submit to the truth. It will set you free. So folk, let's pray. Keep praying for those people. Pray for those people. But folk, the truth of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 7, the Apostle Paul said, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the second coming of Christ, shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, that man of lawlessness be revealed the son of perdition or the son of hell. Do you know what, folk? There's only one other person in all of Scripture that is referred to as the son of perdition. Do you know who it is? Judas. Judas. That's right. In John 17, verse 12, Jesus referred to Judas as the son of hell. The Bible says, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul said, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Folk, when Paul spoke in Thessalonica, he opened up the scriptures from Daniel 7. And he said, this is the man of sin that would change the Ten Commandments. And he said, don't you remember I told you that before Christ could come again, that man of lawlessness had to be revealed. And he had to rule for 1260 years. Don't you remember that? That's what Paul was saying. And so Paul said, now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So folk, the Bible is very, very clear who this man is that will dare to get off the plane at Reagan International, who will dare to speak to the Congress of the United States Folk, this is, not, this is not royalty. This is a snake. This is the man of lawlessness. This is the man who wants to destroy Protestantism in America and throughout the world. And now in August, August 14, Francis gives a catechesis. This was a little over a month ago. And he says, we begin now a series of catechesis on three facets of family life. Celebration, work, and prayer. Let's turn first to celebrations, which as we see from the story of creation are the invention of God, who on the seventh day rested from his work. And we can all say, that's good, that's true. That was the first celebration, if you want to call it that. That was the first sacred festival, if you want to call it that. It's God himself who teaches us the importance of dedicating time to contemplating and enjoying the fruits of our labors. Not only in our employment or profession, but through every action by which we as men and women cooperate in God's creative work, even in times of difficulty. In the workplace, too, we celebrate a birthday, a marriage, a new baby, a farewell, or a welcome. So all of this, folk, we can say, that sounds good, because we're all involved in things like that. But like a snake, a snake, you look at a snake. I, I was going out to my shed to get some books the other day, and this is one of the joys of living in Florida. <laughs> As I opened the back door of the fellowship hall, there was a snake. There was a literal live snake right there. Probably about this long, 
orange, bright orange, bright orange, then a kind of a dirty brown, bright orange, dirty brown, bright orange, dirty brown. Now, I'm not a snake person, but he let me know, don't you come this way. Because if you do, I started to go towards him just to see what he'd do. He shot that tongue out with those two prongs, letting me know, you get any closer, and I'm going to put those into your leg or whatever part of your flesh I can get. But folk just looking at it from afar, it was beautiful. It's beautiful. This right here, that looks good. But now here comes the venom. Here comes the venom, folk. He says, but we know that millions of men and women, even children, are slaves to work. The obsession with economic profit, technical efficiency, puts the human rhythms of life at risk. Moments of rest, especially on Sunday, are sacred because in them we find God. Well, the snake has just stuck his fangs into the human family. The poison has been applied. Where, where in all of Scripture does it say that Sunday is now sacred? Where in Scripture does it say that it's on Sunday that we will receive a special blessing from God? Where? It's not there, folks. And so the snake has now spoken. The Sunday Eucharist brings to our celebrations every grace of Jesus Christ. Oh, really? His presence, his love, his sacrifice, his forming us into a community, and his way of being with us. May we always recognize the family as the privileged place to understand, guide, and sustain the gifts which arise from our celebrations, especially the Sunday Eucharist. He gave that, folks, five weeks ago. Five weeks ago. What's on Francis's mind? Sunday's on his mind. And if the Creator God says it's time, then He's going to be shouting this in the halls of Congress, shouting it in the corridors of the White House and on the streets of Philadelphia. Cunningly devised fables, folks? Messages that makes the world laugh at Seventh-day Adventists? You guys don't know what you're talking about. You and your great controversy about a Sunday law at the end of time. What are you talking about? Cunningly devised fable? No. No, folk. The truth, the bedrock truth of God, the eternal truth of God that is going right through to the New Jerusalem. That's what it is. That's what it is. The Bible says the heavens and the earth were finished and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Therein is the blessing of God. It's on the seventh day Sabbath which is Saturday because that in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. From the book Maranatha, page 191, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. Just what Francis said. Sunday sacredness. 
Oh, but Ellen White, no, she doesn't know what she's talking about. She, she was good for the 19th century, and, and she was good for devotional things like the, the book, The Great Hoax. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's The Great Hope, excuse me. You know, she, she was okay for that century, but, but now, no, she doesn't know what she's talking. Oh, really? Cunningly devised fable, huh? No, 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 no. Being fulfilled right before our eyes, folk, this is why we're doing the work we're doing. To awaken a world wrapped in darkness, to awaken them to the signs of the times. <clears throat> Satan will bring the people under his deceptions through the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, while the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them. And one last point before we close. What about the apostate Protestants? We've already seen what the Seventh-day Adventists are doing. They're uniting with the UN's sustainable developmental goals of the environment. But what about the apostate Protestants? Well, Recently, Rick Warren of Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen, a man of Houston, Texas, 16,000 members. You know where they were? They were at the Vatican. And you know what they were doing? They were declaring reunification of the churches under the Holy See. That's what they were doing, folks. Moments before meeting with reporters, the entire apostate Protestant delegation entered the confessional to take part in the sacrament of penance. You know what that means? They went in and they asked a priest. They told the priest their sins and needed the priest to absolve them, to forgive them for those sins. The sacred act of penance. Yeah, it is. It's sick. It's sick. And Joel Osteen said this. It's important that we participate in these sacred rituals before asking our congregation to do the same. Adding that his time in confession was an immensely moving experience. Being moved by whom? Sorrow, 
hear the rain. No more darkness for the Lord God will light our way. So if you abide in my word and you are my disciple then you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. God so loved us everyone. And these 13 hungry men converge on this little house in Bethany, the home of a man named Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. And they come into this home and they sit down and Middle Eastern custom, and if you've ever been to the Middle East, you know the validity of this story. As soon as those men walked into that house, one of those women got up and headed straight for the kitchen. And that's what they do in the Middle East. I tell you, the first time I went there to, to Egypt, because my wife is from Egypt, folk, we went and visited her relatives. And if I ate every time we went to visit a relative, I would have left Egypt 100 pounds heavier than when I got there. And I kid you not. Every single home you go into, the, the woman immediately gets up and is in the kitchen making, you know, a, a huge meal for you. Well, that's what Martha did, didn't she? She went straight to the kitchen. And folk, when you've got 13 hungry men that walk into your house, you know, that's going to take some prep. And so you can, just, you can just picture her. She's pulling, you know, pans and, and she's telling a servant, go down to the store and get this, this, and that. And she's, you know, turning up whatever she did to heat up things, but she's doing everything, stirring, making sure things don't burn. And then all of a sudden it dawns on her and she says, where in the world is my sister? Why isn't she out here helping me? And then what does Martha do? She heads out to the other room and she says, Lord, would you tell my sister to get out here and help me? And what did Jesus say? Jesus was as hungry as the other 12 men that, that were with him. What did Jesus say? He said, Martha, you are careful and you are troubled about many things. But there's one thing, one thing that is needful. And Mary has chosen the good part that will not be taken away from her. Now, folk, Jesus understood Middle East custom. He understood how people behave in the Middle East. But he told Martha, Martha, there is one thing if you want to talk about Christianity, there's one thing that's needful. And that is what Mary is doing. And what was Mary doing? Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his words. Why was Mary there? Why was Mary there, folks? Do you know the story, Mary's story? Mary was from Bethany, wasn't she? But she was never known as Mary of Bethany. She was known as Mary Magdala or Mary Magdalene. You say, well, wait a minute. She's from Bethany, but she's known by Mary of Magdala or Mary Magdalene? Yeah, that's right. Because you see, folks, Mary lived in Bethany. She went to an Adventist church in Bethany. She was looking for the Messiah in Bethany. But there was an elder in the church who wasn't looking for the Messiah to come. He was looking at her. That's right, James. And his name was Simon of Bethany. And Simon instead of encouraging the people that the Messiah was amongst them, 
He was thinking about how he could get Mary into the bedroom. And he did. He did. And you know how it is in little towns? Everybody knows everything about you more than you know about yourself. You know how towns are like that? Well, everybody knew the story about Mary. And reputation spread very quickly. Oh, Mary's dirty. Mary's easy. Well, you know, you go up, you put up with that a little bit, and you, you don't want any more. Mary left Bethany and went north. And there's a town right around the Sea of Galilee. It's called Magdala. And Mary ended up in Magdala. And so she became known as Mary Magdalene. And it was there that Jesus cast the demons, the seven demons out of her, as Luke 8 tells us. And after a time, in Bethany, or in Magdala, Mary went home. She was a new person. But folk, Mary knew, Mary knew, I can't keep myself pure by myself. I can't do it. So where did Mary find herself? She was at Jesus' feet. Because Mary knew that power, that forgiveness, that peace, that righteousness, that purity came through consuming the words of Jesus. Folk, Mary was being still and knowing that he was God. Now, folk, if you and I are not spending time with Christ, and I'm not talking about at 9 or 10 o'clock at night when you're, when you're dead, and you get on your knees to pray and you say, Dear Lord, and you're gone. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you get up at 5 or 6 or whenever you get up in the morning, your very first work is to get on your knees and to pray and to commit your life to Christ for that day and to pray for your family, to pray for your friends, to pray for your church, to pray for yourself. Folk, that is our work. And if we're not doing that, we might as well just pack it in. Just pack it in. Because everything else is worthless. It's worthless. We can know about prophecy. We can know about Francis. We can put on a show every Sabbath morning. But if we're not spending time with Christ, being still and letting him be God, Amen. pack it in, folks. Pack it in. At Jesus, in Matthew 6, verse 33, he said, But seek, but seek ye, what did he say? First. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus said, that's your first work. Spend time in prayer. Spend time reading your Bible. Spend time reading the spirit of prophecy. You know, folk, I gave a sermon one time. It was in a series I did. It was called, Jesus Loves Chubby Christians. <laughs> now, one Sabbath I gave a sermon, and there was a lady visiting that Sabbath. She and her husband, I can still see him on the front row right over here. I still remember her name, actually. But when I said that, I said, this is the title of the sermon today. As she was a little bit plump, and uh, she was a dear lady. She was older, and she was, you know, a little bit on the heavy side. But when I said that, she said, oh, that's great. I'm so happy. <laughs> I think she misunderstood. Folk, if we're eating, now hear me. 
if we're eating food once a week and we think that when we come to church and we hear the word of God and we hear a, a pastor speak, that that's enough to feed us? What if you tried eating physical food one day out of the week? What would happen to you? You would turn to a skeleton. You wouldn't be worth anything to anybody, would you? You wouldn't be able to do anything. So it is in the spiritual life. If I'm eating one day a week, I am an emaciated, starving, famine-filled person. And I'm a losing Christian. I'm, I'm, a loser. I'm a loser. I'm a loser. Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Nothing. Now Bud and Barb at their house have some beautiful vines. And Bud last night made me probably some of the most delicious grape juice I've ever tasted. But you know what? Those branches, I noticed this morning, those branches are all connected to the main stalk. And if I cut those branches off and disconnected them from the main stalk, they would cease to bear fruit. They'd cease to. Folk, there isn't a single person in this room, none of us, we cannot produce purity. We cannot produce right doing. We cannot obey one of God's commandments. We cannot be patient. We cannot be kind. We naturally, naturally, all of us in this room, we are all impure, like filthy rags. We are impatient. We are unkind. We are. We are selfish. The only hope for each one of us is spending time by ourselves praying to the Lord Jesus Christ and committing his word to memory so that we can receive strength on a daily basis. I'm going to tell you something. When I travel around to various corners of the world, to the Philippines and South Korea and Okinawa and Germany and Australia and, and all over, one of the things that I absolutely despise is when I get off the plane and I am picked up and then I am driven to someone's home and I am put in a room and told that the meetings will be start in six hours. And you'll have a meal in three. Folk, when I go into that room, this, this overwhelming feeling of loneliness, it, it, just, it just comes over me. And I feel like screaming. And I feel like, why am I here? That's what I feel. And I am so thankful. I am so thankful that I can get down on my knees. And I don't know, I've done this everywhere I've gone. But I will get down on my knees and feeling that, that loneliness, that sense of desertion, 
And I will kneel down and I will say, Lord, I feel so alone here. And into my mind will come this promise. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Folk, when I hear that promise, that feeling of loneliness, it's like it, it just, boom, it disappears. And I feel great. But I always experience that. Where does that verse come from? Why, why and how can that verse minister to me? It's because I've memorized it. It's in my head. Now, folk, if I read Scripture correctly, from what we studied here this morning, if these things in God's timetable begin to unfold right before our eyes, as they very well could, some of us could end up in places we've never been before. Now let's be real clear about what I'm saying. I'm saying we could end up in a prison cell, a dungeon, or folk, even a stake, a guillotine. You say, Bill, I didn't come to listen to that today. Folk, that's reality. Is that not reality? Is that not what the great controversy says? We've got to face the music. When I think of John Huss, the famous Bohemian reformer, who at the Council of Constance in 1410, 1411, was thrown into that dungeon, how did that man survive? Because the Word of God was there. He had committed the Word of God to memory so that when he faced things that looked humanly impossible, the Word of God enabled him to do what he couldn't do. But folk, the Word of God can only minister to us if we have put it here. And the only way that we can put it here is if we spend quality time when our mind is clear in devotions with God. Paul said, Paul said, I've got a grocery list of good things that I've done in my life. He said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the, the church, touching the righteousness of the law, blameless. Paul had a grocery list of all these things he had done to say, God, you need to accept me because I've done this, 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 and that. And then he said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss, save for the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And then he said, and I count those things as dung. He said, I count those things as garbage that I may win Christ. And then Paul summed up his one desire. He said, that I may know him. That I may know him. And folk, I pray, I pray that Paul's desire becomes our daily desire each morning that I may know him, that I may spend time with Jesus and commit his word to memory so that his righteousness becomes mine. Amen.
That's my prayer for each one of us. That will see us through whatever the devil has out there for us. We can go through it with Jesus. Amen. And go through it. Now, let's get to the sermon. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, I just pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Continue to impress upon us the great need we have each day to spend time with you because only your grace will be sufficient for what is coming. We just pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us now as we study and share together. Thank you for this quiet place and this beautiful uh, this beautiful place of Coos Bay. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. He has given you the former rain moderately. He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Question, when did the early rain, when did it begin to fall? When was that? Pentecost. Acts, Acts chapter 2. Verses 1 through 11, when the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles in the upper room, they began to speak in foreign languages to break the barrier of language so that the gospel could go to all of these different uh, cultures of people from Mesopotamia to Egypt to Cyrene to the Arabians and so on. That's when the early rain began to fall. Now in Acts of the Apostles, pages 54 and 55, Ellen White said, The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the Apostles was the beginning of the early or former reign. And glorious was the result. To the end of time, the presence of the Spirit is to abide with the true church. What is the message what is the purpose or the function of the early rain? Because the early rain folk has continued to fall. The presence and power of the Holy Spirit is still with the people of God today. But what is the purpose of the early rain today? What is its purpose? Somebody tell me. This is, a, this is a, a time where we can give and take a look. What's the purpose of the early rain today? Somebody tell me. Okay, to share the gospel. That's one thing. How about individually? Character formation. Okay. Let's notice. First Testimonies, page 619. I was shown that if God's people make no efforts on their part, but wait for the refreshing... Now, if you study Ellen White's writings, when she talks about the refreshing, she's talking about the latter rain. That's what she's talking about. She says, if we're waiting for the latter rain to come upon them and remove their wrongs and correct their errors, if they depend upon the latter rain to cleanse them from filthiness of the flesh and spirit and fit them to engage in the loud cry of the third angel, they will be found wanting. So the, the latter rain of the Holy Spirit, when it comes, folk, it is not coming to empower us to overcome sin. It's not what it's coming for. Okay, that's what she just said. The refreshing, the latter rain or power of God comes only on those who have prepared themselves for it by doing the work which God bids them, namely, cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The purpose of the early reign is to empower us to overcome, 
to be cleansed, to be pure. Cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Now Ellen White is quoting a Bible verse right there. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. How can we have this experience? How can we have that experience? 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. We can't do it by ourselves. But through the power of the promise of God, here we can resist. What did David say? He said, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. He said, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. What did Peter say? He said, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Ellen White's not saying here that we are to walk independent of God and to have this experience. She's saying we have a job to do. Our job is to be in submission. When the devil attacks, we, we're surrendered to Christ. That's our work is to surrender, is to be in submission and to be thinking on God's promise. That's our work. Amen. But folk, if we're waiting for this experience, for the latter rain to give us this experience, we will be found wanting. Clark read the scripture reading this morning, 1 Peter 1.23, it said, Seeing ye have purified your souls. How? Can't do that. In obeying the truth? I can't do that either. But how? Through the Spirit. Through the power of the early reign of the Holy Spirit. We can purify, our souls can be purified. We can obey through the power of the early reign of the Holy Spirit, we can. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Desire of Ages, page 107. What an awesome promise. In all who submit, there's our work. In all who submit to his power, the Spirit of God will consume sin. Is that a wonderful promise? Amen. The Holy Spirit will empower us to overcome. That's what it says. He'll burn it up. He'll consume it. But if men cling to sin, they become identified with it. Now maybe somebody here is saying, that, that, that can't be. That can't be. I, I've, been an, I've been an Adventist all my life. I have never heard this before. I've been told I, can, I will be saved in my sins and that at the latter reign, God will change me. I'm sure you have heard that. You know, one of the reasons I was fired was because 23 year, 24 years ago in a Sabbath school class, I was a Sabbath school teacher in uh, Red Bluff, California in the, in the Sabbath school. Seventh-day Adventist Church, and there was a visitor, and he was sitting right over there on the right pew, or front row. Never seen him before, but he had been invited to the church because he'd just been on a glorified missionary trip. And uh, 
So the lesson that day was on Psalm 37. And so I read through the quarterly and there was a lot of fluff that was absolutely meaningless. And so I read through and I said, what is the crux of Psalms 37? Okay, what is the meat of Psalm 37? Well, I found it in Psalm 37. Let's read it. Psalm 37, verse 31. This is the early rain experience right here. The Bible says the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Now, folk, that is the same experience of the people in Revelation 14 who have responded to the three angels' messages who of, of whom it is written, Here are they that do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. I said, this is what the Sabbath school lesson is going to be on. Well, I started in on that verse, and this gentleman right over here, he raised his hand and he said, he said, you think that we can overcome sin? I said, sir, the Bible says that. I said, that's what the purpose of the latter rain is. He said, he said, so you think we can have victory in our lives? I said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, prove it to me. So I said, well, sir, let's start with uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And then we went to Isaiah 59, 19. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. Jude 24, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And I looked at him and I said, sir, would you like me to go on? And his wife turned to him and said, Dear, quit it. You're not going to change his mind. So he stopped. Now the following Wednesday, I got a letter from that man. And the letter said, he said, the garbage, now he was an elder in a Seventh-day Adventist church. He was an elder. He said, the garbage that you were teaching in your Sabbath school class last Sabbath was worse than David sleeping with Bathsheba. Now, folk, he was an elder in a Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay? Now, I wrote back to him, and I said, Sir, what you call garbage is the eternal truth of God's word. And obviously no amount of, of proof is going to convince you of anything. And I said, sir, if I wanted to, I could write you a hundred pages of spirit of prophecy and Bible statements that prove that that is the experience of the early rain that God's people must have. But I said, I'm not going to give you as another verse I'm only going to ask you a question that an independent minister asked an Adventist leader in a mountain years, centuries ago when Jesus said, are you a master in Israel and you don't know these things? You know what, folk? When I was being fired as a teacher from that school, when I lost my job as the Sabbath school teacher and then as the teacher in the school, the primary reason that was given was because I offended. I offended a visiting elder from another church. So folk, if you've heard that you can be saved in your sins, that's why. 
because that is the message that's been given in Seventh-day Adventism for the last two generations or maybe more. But folk, it is a lie that comes straight from hell. And when you hear an Adventist pastor get up and say you're going to be sinning till Jesus comes, or that the Holy Spirit of the latter reign will change you, you have just listened to the devil himself. Review and Herald, March 2, 1897. The work that God has begun in the human heart in giving his light and knowledge must be continually going forward. Every individual must realize his own necessity. It's okay. It's okay if we feel a need. That's the best place to be in. The problem with us as Laodiceans is, is we say... I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, I don't need anything. And folk, that is spiritual destruction. That will destroy us. Our greatest need is to realize our need. That's, that's what we've got to do. So it's okay to say, I, I can't do right by myself. That's okay, admit it. Be honest. Be honest with yourself. Because God knows us. And he knows how desperate our need is. So it's okay to say, God, I need you. The heart must be emptied of every defilement, cleansed for the indwelling of the Spirit. It was by confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer, do we even know what earnest prayer is? I don't think we know what that means. We know how to say, I mean, this, this for a lot of us, and I hate to say it, but I'm going to say it. But most of us, our prayer life is this. We sit down at a meal. Lord, thank you for this food. Bless the missionaries. And, and, and thanks, and, and we'll see you Sabbath. Amen. And we're gone. That is the essence of our prayer life. Do, do, how many of us know, how many of us know what it's like with what Jacob went through? What's that? We, yeah, and we better know quick. We better know quick. What did Jacob say? He said, I'm not going to let go of you until you bless me. Now that's earnest prayer, folk. How many of us know how to do that? That's what God's calling us to today, to spend time in prayer. And for most of us to get on our knees for five or ten minutes? Are you kidding me? Five or ten minutes? What would I say? That's our attitude. That's our attitude. Our prayer life is about five to ten seconds at breakfast in the morning, and that's it. And we wonder why, our li why we don't have victory in our lives, why we are beset with sins that we are continually being overcome by, but we are reassured by a satanic pastor who says, you know, you're just going to keep on sinning till Jesus comes. Or at the latter rain, he'll change you then. Folk, you're listening to a demon in, in shoes. By earnest prayer, consecration of themselves to God that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The same work, only in greater degree, must be done now. You say, Bill, I haven't had that experience. I don't, I don't know how to do that. What do I do? Well, you start by getting on your knees. That's what we've all got to do. You know, when I became a Christian, I, th I thought being a Christian was something um, 
celestial and you know as you pray you begin to feel this aura coming over you and you know you get this warm gooey feeling it's not what it is at all that's not what Christianity is it's getting down on your knees and saying Lord I am a miserable sinner I can't do anything right I'm impatient I'm rude I'm unkind I'm impure but I've heard about your son Jesus who went to the cross for a wretched sinner like me. Thank you that he died in my behalf. Thank you that he loves me. How, how he can do that, I don't know, but thank you that he does because your word says so. Well, there, there's the beginning right there. There's the beginning. The purposes of the early reign, cleansing ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, confessing and forsaking sin. The heart must be emptied of every defilement, cleansed for the indwelling of the spirit. These are the purposes of the early reign. Right now, today, this is what God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through his promises, wants to give us this experience. And if we don't have this experience, we will not receive the latter rain. We just won't. Years ago, had some young men in my class at school when I taught back in Philadelphia, just outside of Philadelphia, at Greater Philadelphia Junior Academy. We were studying the books of Daniel and Revelation. The children were excited. They loved it. There were these two young men. One's name was Danny. The other was John. They were two handsome young men, 14 years old. The girls just loved them. Um, they knew it. But they were studying the Bible in class, in Bible class. And they came up to me one day, folk, and I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit was, was literally just, just saying, boys... I am real, and, and I want you. And I couldn't believe it, but these two boys who were so just, you know, so free and, and fun and, and just laughter and all that, they were dead serious. And they came up to me and they said, Mr. Hughes, can we talk to you? I said, yeah. So we went out walking. They said, Mr. Hughes, what you're teaching us, we can see it. it. It's true. It's real. And I said, guys, God is calling you today. He wants you to follow him. He wants to use you in this world to glorify him. I said, boys, God wants you to, to kneel down before him and to give your lives to Christ today. That's what he wants. I said, would you guys, you guys want to do that with me right now? And they backed, they backed away and they said, Mr. Hughes, everything you've said, we can see it clear as day, but, but we're young. But they said at the time of the Sunday law, we'll change. We'll, we'll get everything right. As, as soon as the Sunday law passes, we'll commit ourselves to Christ. And I said, boys, if you wait till then, it'll be too late. Because if you live a life apart from God, all the way till that time, when that time comes, that pattern of life will be so ingrained, you won't be able to change it then. You can't. You can't. Now is the time. I don't know what those boys have done through the years. I still pray for John and Danny. But I know that day they, they rejected the pleading of the Holy Spirit. I know that. The latter rain is coming on those that are pure. 
General Conference Bulletin 1893, page 179. None receive the latter rain but those who do all they can. Christ will help us. All could be overcomers. All can be overcomers by the grace of God, not by ourselves, by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus. All heaven is interested in this work. Angels are interested. God can make them a host against their enemies. But ye give up too quick. The arm of God is mighty. Satan works in different ways to steal the mind off from God. Victory, victory, we must have it over every wrong. A solemn sinking into God. Get ready, set thine house in order. You know, there was a man who heard that message a long time ago. He heard the same message that Ellen White said right there. But he heard it in a different context. Because when he heard the message of sanctification, he saw an army coming back to the camp. And he saw men that were being carried that were dead. In fact, 36 of them had died. But he heard the message, sanctify yourself, submit yourself to Christ. But he refused it. Because he had something, he had something in his tent that was hidden in his tent. The soldiers came back defeated. Some were dead. He watched Joshua and the elders laying flat in the dirt. He saw the depressed condition of the people of God. He saw Seventh-day Adventism in a frightful condition, a sitting duck before its enemies. He saw that. He saw the foes that were out there to oppose God's people. He saw that, didn't he? He saw the Canaanite tribes. And he heard the call to sanctify the people. Sanctify yourselves. Through the grace of God, put away sin. And then he heard those terrible words. There's an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. You know, isn't it interesting? People say, you know, I've heard people back home, they, they say to me, they say, well, you know, Bill, you know, you do those mass mailings, but you don't have a lot of people in your church. Or why aren't people coming into the church? Well, folk, you know, I think there's things in our camps today that keep people away. If they came in and they saw the junk that was in amongst us, they'd run out in horror. So while we're doing mailings, we need to be getting this thing ready too. The call to confess and put away sin was given. He heard the dreadful news that some cursed thing was in the midst of the church. He knew that it meant him. What would he do about it? How about pornographic DVDs in a home? Coveting them. Holding on to them. Hiding them that nobody can see it. Someone's holding on to pots of gold and silver while the work of God suffers. Someone's coveting things that heaven doesn't approve. The call to forsake these things is heard. The message rings through the encamp. But we folk become slaves to these things worse than the people that were enchained from Africa to the New World. We won't budge. We've got to hold on to those things. And Paul says, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies in obeying the lust thereof. 
Sin is destroying us. It's destroying families. One day your family will die because of our sins. Will we submit it to Christ? The consequences are the same today as they were in the days of Achan. You know, folk, Achan heard that message. He heard it. Get rid of it. It's not worth it. It's going to destroy you. But he went to bed that night. It was right in the middle of his tent, wasn't it? And the next morning, he gets up. And everybody's assembled in the encamp, all of them by tribes. And Achan has a chance to get right with the Lord. Did he take advantage of it? He didn't. He had time. But he didn't take advantage of it. And so then the lot falls and it goes to his tribe. Achan still has opportunity for repentance. Still has opportunity to confess. Did he take advantage of it? No, he didn't. He held on. He held on to his sin. from the tribe of Judah, it went to his family, the tribe of Carmi. And then it went to the next person in his family line. And then finally, folk, Joshua is staring him right between the eyes. And then, folks, it was too late. There was no more repentance. And Joshua said to him, Achan, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God and make confession. Achan acknowledged his guilt, but when it was too late for the confession to benefit himself. He had seen the armies of Israel return from Ai defeated, yet he did not come forward and confess his sin. He had seen Joshua and the elders of Israel bowed to the earth in grief. Had he then made confession, he would have given some proof of true penitence. But he still kept silence. He had listened to the proclamation that a great crime had been committed and had even heard its character definitely stated. But his lips were sealed. It's a scary thing, folks. It's a scary thing. Achan had time. He didn't make it right. It destroyed him. Destroyed him. We can play. What do we got in our tent, folks? We've all got carpets. We've all got rugs at home. Underneath Achan's rug there at his home, in his tent, was a goodly Babylonish garment and some shekels of gold, a golden bar, that's what he said. What's underneath our rug? What is in our tent? You know, we can sit here, you can hide it from, we can all hide whatever we want to hide, folks. But when the God of heaven, when he looks into our tent, does he see what's in our tent? You bet he does. Are we watching things we shouldn't watch? Are we coveting things we shouldn't covet? Are we clinging to things that we know are wrong? And the Spirit of God is, is pleading with us to get rid of it. What is in our tent today? If it's something that is destroying you, get rid of it. Don't justify it. Don't covet it. Don't cling to it. Get rid of it before it destroys us, before it destroys you, me, our families. Get rid of it, friends. It destroyed Achan, 
and his family. It will do the same. God is no respecter of persons. Same today, folks. Wow. Took the tribe of Judah. Took the family of the Zarhites. It's getting closer. Took the Zarhites man by man. It's, I mean, can you just see it? It's getting closer and closer till finally Joshua is looking Achan right in the face. Now there's no more chance. Now, folk, what we saw this morning, we are coming to a point, if God wills with time, because only he holds time in his hands. Francis has Sunday on his mind, folks. That means that the latter rain is coming Soon, because when the Sunday law comes, the latter rain will come. And when the latter rain comes, folk, there won't be any more changes. Because when the latter rain falls, the latter rain seals, does not change. It seals what's already there. If there's sin there, the Holy Spirit will seal that sin in our lives for eternity. Do you understand that? There's no change then. Change is now. It's now. The Lord has clearly shown that the image of the beast, the setting up of apostate Protestants passing a Sunday law, will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. Achan, friends, Achan went to church every Sabbath, but Achan's experience showed that he was a Sunday keeper. He was a Sunday keeper. We can go to church every Sabbath, if we are choosing sin and we're hiding something under our rug throughout the week, coveting and indulging those sins that we know God wants us to get rid of, and we come to church on Sabbath, we are Sunday keepers. We're Sunday keepers. And we will be marked with the mark of the beast. Folk, I'm so thankful today that God in his infinite mercy and amazing grace has called each one of us today, right here. We're living at the end of time. Francis has Sunday on his mind and he's coming to America. If God in his timetable wills it to be, we could hear Sunday laws being agitated very very quickly. We could, and we could not, because time is in God's hands. But folk, God is calling us today to the experience of sanctification. May God help us to allow him to do that for each one of us. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your love to us. Thank you for the privileges that are ours. Thank you for the promises of your word that can help us to do what we can't do. We just pray that you'd strengthen us, and I pray, Lord, that each one of us would make that decision every day to spend time with you in the morning. 
that we might have this glorious experience that we've been studying about here today of victory over sin through the power of Christ.